What I would like to do with this part of the talk is give you some vocabulary that you can use to look at pictures and decide why you like them or why you don't like them. Also to show you that you can take pictures of things other than your dog or um, a birthday party or some other subject matter. When we talk about composition, we're talking about how the elements of art are arranged within the frame according to certain principles of art. And those elements, everybody pretty much agrees on. They're line, shape, form, color, value, texture, and space. And if you make a picture, if you have a picture that doesn't have any line, shape, form, color, value, texture, or space, it'll look like this. So it'll just be a blank sheet of paper or empty photograph. Line is something long and thin. In geometry, it's, um, it has length but not, no width or no height. As a line gets shorter, it starts to become a shape. If you make a line short enough, it's obviously a rectangle. Also, if you take a line and join the ends, you get a shape. And then form is different from shape. Shape is flat, form is three-dimensional. If I were to tell you that this is a picture about line, would you buy that? A lot of lines in that picture, aren't there? And that's primarily what makes up most of the picture. There's also some shapes, and we can see light and dark, which is value. I put this uh, slide into the presentation to uh, present to you the idea that you can make a photograph that's about line. Another photograph that line is very important in. We also have color. We have value. We have light greens and dark greens. But line's very prevalent, very pronounced in this. And it's probably what makes it interesting. If we were to do away with a line, we just kind of have some green color in various shades. Now, shapes are or appear to be flat. So there's nothing in this picture that looks three-dimensional unless it's the um, disintegrating duct tape on the right side there. But for the most part, it's just flat, isn't it? There's some graffiti painted on the mailbox. Somebody put um, stickers on it. So those are shapes. And form is different from shape in that it's three-dimensional. So is there any question in your mind that this takes up space, that we're looking at something that's three-dimensional? Okay, so we have a sphere here. How do we know that this flower is three-dimensional? Yeah, because of the shadows. This bloom was facing up towards the sky, so I shot down on it. And the light, because it was early morning, or fairly early, was coming across it. So this is side lighting. Notice how side lighting creates a sense of form by creating shadows that tell you that things are three-dimensional. If you want to emphasize form in something, side lighting is a very good way to do it. Put your light coming from the side. If I were to photograph this same flower at noon, or if the flower had been facing the sun, it wouldn't look this three-dimensional. Color. We're talking about hues. Say if we're painting, we have uh, red, yellow, and blue. If we're uh, working with light and computer screens, monitors, and digital cameras, then the color model is different. We're working with, we're working with an RGB model. RGB, red, green, and blue. If we're talking about printing, then we have a CMYK model where all the colors can be made by mixing cyan, magenta, yellow, and then you need black in printing because you can't get a true black by mixing cyan, magenta, and yellow. Now, black, white, and gray are not colors. They're called neutrals in art. So, if I were to say this is a picture about color, you could say, no, it's about ducks, but the ducks are pretty much overwhelmed by the color, aren't they? If we made this black and white, it wouldn't be the same picture. It might be interesting, I don't know. 
but the color is very important in this photograph. And color can be used to emphasize the idea of a picture or the reason for making a picture or the emotion behind a picture. How does color contribute to meaning in this photograph? First of all, what might we call this picture? Rage. Rage. Very good. That's what I called it, rage. Why would you call it rage? Because it has a lot of red in it. Yeah. And yeah, and it's splashed. It's, yeah. it's like blood dripping down a wall or something, isn't it? In terms of the different uh, things like lines and shapes, uh, there is no form here, values and so on, we get that feeling of blood or anger or any kind of a negative emotion. We see the child screaming there. We get the cute little rabbit, but his ears dripping. And uh, we see freedom, yeah, right. It's uh, a very negative political or social statement. We also get that patch of green, which I think is important. It's kind of a sickly green next to the red, and it contrasts with the red, and again, it's dripping. So the color scheme here helps to support that feeling of anger or rage. Value. We're talking now about black, white, and gray. And you remember the elephant ear plant that I said was about line that was mostly green. Well, we had light green and dark green and in-between green. Those are values also, but it's easier to um, think of values in terms of black, white, and gray. So uh, for this part of the talk, I'm going to show you some black and white pictures. But just keep in mind that you can have value in uh, pictures that have color. Okay, so there's a nice range of uh, blacks, whites, and grays in this scene. And it's those subtle differences in grays that allow us to see all the details. Can you see how it's those different shades of gray that bring out all the detail? If you have a, a dominance of light tones in a picture, we call that lighting, high key lighting. And if the dark tones dominate, we call that low key lighting. Usually low key is used more for moody shots. If we eliminate the grays, we end up with high contrast. So in this scene, there are some areas that kind of appear gray, but mostly it's black and white dots. And if there's gray, it's because there are black dots with white dots. So a very, this is a very grainy, gritty picture. And high contrast is good for conveying a sense of uh, grittiness or edginess. In my class, I try to teach you to record all of the tones and not to do things like this. It doesn't mean you can't do this uh, and that it can't be effective, but if you record all of the tonalities to begin with. You can always get rid of them later. But if you do a high contrast picture where you clip your uh, uh, shadows and clip your highlights at the beginning, then you can't get that information back. So you, you've given up some of your choices. Okay, texture. Well, that last picture had a lot of texture in it. If I said this was a picture about texture, would you buy that? Okay. There's a lot of color. Yeah, there's a lot of color in it, too. Um, and then the question is, when you look at it, what do you think first? If you like the color scheme, you may think color. I think it's a good example of texture because you can see the roughness and the smoothness. You look at it, and if you're sensitive to texture, it almost hurts to run your eye over this area. Another picture. We definitely have a face here, but texture is very important in this picture. This is from a exhibition of stencil art in the Lake Street Tunnel in London. And because of the lighting, notice where the light is. It's up on the side of the tunnel, up high. So we're really getting side lighting, aren't we? 
It's shining across that wall. And notice how uh, he's peeled stucco off or plaster off the wall of the tunnel there and created the shape uh, and the uh, plasters on the ground there and it creates a pile of rubble that has lots of texture and the wall itself has lots of texture. So we get some smooth texture and some rough texture. So it's a picture about a face, but it's also a picture that's a lot about texture. And our last uh, element of art is space. And space can be shallow or deep. You can also have positive space and negative space. What kind of space do we have in this photograph? Would you call it shallow or deep? Yeah, it's pretty pretty shallow because the fence in the background is cutting off the background. So we only see from here to there, and that's not very far. How about this picture? Deeper. And what creates a sense of deep space here? The continuity of the car as you see going down. Okay, we have parallel lines that seem to converge as they go towards the back of the car. That's called perspective. When parallel lines converge, call that perspective, and that creates a sense of space to a photograph or a painting. What else contributes to the sense of space? Yeah, and the red bars. So as we go further back into space, the people get smaller, and the red bars get thinner and shorter. And, and we know they don't really get, the people don't get smaller, and the bars don't get thinner and shorter. So we say, ah, it's, they're farther away. Putting things in the foreground, middle ground, background, at, at different distances from the viewer, tends to emphasize space. Okay, and then we might talk about um, space in terms of positive space and negative space. And the positive space is the space taken up by something that we're photographing uh, or some, some subject that we're painting or whatever. So in this case, Betty Hahn is the positive space. And her photograph on the wall behind her is positive space. And she's surrounded by a whole lot of white negative space. Negative space isn't bad. In fact, in this case, it seems to make her kind of float in the picture frame. If we look at her picture on the wall, though, black becomes the negative space and white becomes the positive space in that it's the white blobs that show us that we're looking at somebody talking on a telephone, if you can see that. She was experimenting at this point in her career with uh, a lot of real high contrast pictures. Okay, so positive space and negative space. All right, so those are the elements of art. We're going to talk about the principles of art next.